the, the, the expectation of like glossy production values has dropped so significantly. You know what I mean? Like the, the expectation that things are supposed to look a certain way, right? So then the emphasis has been placed way more on like the content, like what is being said? Like, what are these people actually talking about? Is this interesting? Does this make sense? Is this important? That's a much more, uh, much greater emphasis these days, you know? And mm -hmm. then, so I, I, that, that, part I, that part I think is really cool. All right, so we are joined in this next hour by, uh, by uh, you know, legendary organizer, um, educator, um, just an incredible, you know, incredible, incredible human being here in, in the city of Los Angeles and beyond uh ron goches so ron let's get right into this i, I want to you know i want to you know you're, you're so well known you're such a fixture in 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 you know in marches and in, in rallies and and just you know in, in organizing spaces you know long before anyone steps foot on a stage or or grabs a microphone you know you, you, you know you're 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 one of the people that really drives a lot of um a lot of organizing activism in the city um but you weren't born that way right i mean you had you had to you had to you had to get involved and and, and see that there was something wrong with the world that they really, um, and, and then decide to do something. So tell, tell us that story. How did you get involved in, in politics? All right. Um, I think it, maybe I was born into it, man. Maybe I oh, was you were. born you were. It. <laughs> um, So I, I, I always go back to um, even before I was born, um, my mom actually uh, became pregnant with me here in Los Angeles, uh, but she went back to El Salvador where she's from um when she was still pregnant and she didn't have papers she went back to pick up my great grandmother who obviously also didn't have papers so then both of them were coming back here you know without papers and my mom was pregnant so if they would have gotten caught uh you know they would have been sent back to El Salvador I would have been born there uh, I was born in 81 um the the revolution in El Salvador started in 1980 so that would have been a very different reality for me growing up um so that's like in the context that I'm born, you know, in, in the middle or in the beginning stages of the revolution in Salvador. Um, as I grew up here in LA, um, growing up, you know, wasn't like starving, but obviously we weren't rich. My, you know, my parents are working class people. My mom uh, was a housekeeper. My dad worked with furniture all of his life. Um, so, you know, we, we lived okay. Um, but when I really started to get what I would I, later in life realize would be revolutionary ideas was when I was nine years old. Uh, so now it's 1990 and I went to El Salvador for the first time. My mom took me, even though the war was still happening, the war ended in 1992. Um, I mean, I didn't know, obviously I was nine years old. I didn't know what was going on, but I do remember a lot clearly. I vividly remember what my experiences were in El Salvador, seeing uh, extreme poverty and misery, seeing people who have no food, um, and, and, and playing soccer. I remember playing soccer with kids, you know, barefoot kids. And I remember going to the home of one of the kids after the game and uh, me being a kind of a big kid, uh, I remember telling him, hey man, so like, you know, let's go eat. I'm hungry that, you know, it's time to eat. And he says, well, we don't have food today. And that concept, I just, my brain couldn't register it. I was like, well, what do you mean you don't have food today? And he goes, well, my mom's not here, she's at work. And sometimes, sometimes, she brings food home. And to a nine-year-old kid who has never had to face hunger, that's just uh, something I couldn't really fathom. And so from that point forward, um, you know, I started asking a lot of questions, you know, internally, just like, how come some people have food and how come some people don't? How come some people have homes? How come some people don't? And now this is, you know, I'm talking about the late, uh, late 80s and, and now 90s, we're talking about like the height of like, you know, in, in LA, whether it's like, you know, the crack epidemic, um, you know, gang warfare, all this kind of stuff um, that I saw on, on one hand. And on the other hand, you see, uh, you know, the Hollywood LA, like the fancy stuff, the rich folks, and it looked nothing like my reality. And it definitely didn't look like El Salvador in 1990 uh, when I was there. So I think those, those experiences made me question a lot uh, about why society is the way that it is. And then, you know, I always go to uh, one of my uncles who passed away a few years ago, my Theo Biden or Eduardo, uh, who he um, saw Lawrence had to flee the country because of the war. Um, his son was uh, kidnapped by the military and forced to be a child soldier pretty much. And the family never saw him again. And so my uncle had a deep, deep resentment towards the US government. He understood what imperialism was 
directly firsthand because it had affected his family. And so he, he uh, fled from El Salvador. He came here to, to LA. He lived with us. And, um, you know, growing up, I just remember him always saying bad stuff about the U.S., him always saying, you know, how bad the U.S. was. And I'm a little, I'm a little kid being raised in L.A. with, you know, obviously an American school. And, you know, they teach you all this patriotic stuff, the Pledge of Allegiance and all these things. So when I hear my uncle saying all these bad things, I, I wasn't really it. But, like, I remember, for example, during the, the first uh, U.S. invasion of Iraq in 91, I remember my uncle saying that he hoped Saddam Hussein won. And I was like, what? Uncle, are you crazy? Why? He's a bad guy and Americans are the good guys, right? So these are the internal questions I couldn't really understand at the time. But that uncle, uh, his questions and his positions on things, even though at the time I didn't understand them, later on in life, I, I understood where he was coming from. And at the time, I didn't know that his, his son had been kidnapped. Later on, I find out. And that explains why there was such resentment and at some point, uh, just bitterness um, in, on, you know, in him and why he was so against U.S. imperialism. And I don't think he used the big terms that, you know, imperialism and capitalism and whatnot, but he definitely understood the United States was the, the cause for the war in El Salvador and, and, you know, their role there. So I think that upbringing um, really put me in a position where I, I had so many questions to better understand what I had seen. And uh, a little bit later in life, in middle school age, um, you know, my mom, as I mentioned, was a housekeeper and she worked in Santa Monica pretty much my entire life. And when I went to middle school, she put me in a middle school in Santa Monica. So we lived in the hood, but I went to school in Santa Monica, which was a different planet. It could have been a different planet. And that experience, again, really exposed the differences in society to me. And when I got to high school, you know, going to school with 15 year old kids driving you know, BMWs and, and stuff like that, when we just took the bus every day to school, that really forced me to say, look, man, something's going on, something's not right. And so I think that's how, by the time I graduated from high school, I already had a whole lot of questions and all I needed was somebody to start giving some answers. And I think that's what I got once I got to be at college age. Yeah, I, um, I, I was, you know, I remember I was uh, probably about 10 or, or, or I was young as well uh, during the, the Iraq war and I remember, um, you know, leading up to it, there was, I mean, Saddam was saying, I think there was an interview or something, and he said something to effect of, like, who is the U.S. to judge me? Look what you, how you treat, he, he named a couple groups, but he also named, like, um, Hawaiians, like, uh, Native Hawaiians, mm -hmm. and I remember that being, like, a huge, like, like, a moment in my mind, um, like, a like a, like, a thing in my mind, like, maybe the U.S. is bad, you know, <laughs> like, I never, I never really, and it was, because it was, you know, I'd heard things, you know, Native Americans, African Americans, this is something you usually hear, right? And I knew, I knew, I knew our conditions um, were like not equal, sort of. I kind of had an inkling of that, but, um, but the, the something about saying Hawaiians kind of threw me off, and it was like, oh, maybe, you know, maybe there's something here. So I, I think that war, in a way, uh, also had an effect on me. So can you speak a little bit to like how, you know, like it's almost like a, there's like political chapters of war. I mean, war kind of like defines like uh, a lot of our political awakening in this country. Absolutely. Um, I went I went to San Diego State for college. I got lucky enough. I don't know how, but I got into college. And uh, when I was out there, uh, I, my at the end of my freshman year, really, I, I joined Mecha, uh, which for a lot of us is, is where we kind of learn our political ABCs. And that definitely was the case for me. Um, and I remember in uh, my, my junior year, 2001, uh, that happened to be the year when 9-11 happened. Um, and so, of course, quickly that escalated into, you know, the second war in Iraq. And that really, really made us like kind of cut our teeth and learning about how to organize these anti-war marches. And I remember going to actions all over the place in L.A. and San Francisco and different places for actions against uh, the war in Iraq and in Afghanistan. Um, so these wars do play a huge role. And well, first of all, I mean, it depends on how, how far back we go, but if you go back to the, you know, the Mexican-American War, where it defines why today, uh, you know, Mexicanos are, are called illegals on their own land, uh, but war is always something constant. And as a, as a U.S. history teacher, I always tell kids, look, like every, about every decade or so, there's another war. And if there's no bad guy, the U.S. will make one up. But the point is, you have to have uh, a war because, of course, that drives the economy and, you know, the nationalism, the patriotism, the white nationalism that really uh, gave birth to this country. 
So yeah, war is an extremely important uh, fundamental part of the understanding of the reality the, of this nation from its, from its conception until today. Um, so it's, it's, it's important that you bring up the point of war. Yeah. And I mean, I think we see that, you know, oftentimes, you know, war is an economic driver, but at times war, not full scale war, but just like the threat of war, bombing war, it is used to galvanize a public away from something else, right? So for instance, Bill Clinton, in the midst of his, his, his scandals, he bombs Somalia, he escalates a war uh, uh, to dismember Yugoslavia. Um, mm -hmm. more, more recently, Donald Trump, for no reason, decided to, put, to take warships to Venezuela just to, just to, just to do something. So w w what I'm interested in is not that, the, that these people do that. But what does that say about the, the, the general US public and the, when we need to be out there teaching people that, 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 they, that they approve of such things? Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the major differences uh, around the world is that this, this country as a nation state, whereas in most places, people are against the repressive state, the United States was born where the majority of its population was supporters and participants in the re repression of the majority of people at the time, of course, was with the natives and, and then Africans. So this country was born addicted to war, as the title of the book says. And, and, and we've seen that it continues to be that way until today. So, you know, um, war, depending on how you, how you or what you base your um, definition of it, we always say, we remind people that, you know, when we go to these big anti-war marches, when we, whether it's against the wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, et cetera, Syria, or so many others, yeah, of course we call for the end of those wars because we are anti-imperialist and we believe that those wars are uh, unjust and immoral. But we also say that if those wars ended today, the war on us continues every day. You know, the war on working class people in this country continues every single day. So sometimes, you know, we often um, have disagreements with the, with the white left because they, you know, the, they say stop the wars and that's fine. But we say that if you stop the wars abroad, but everything else stayed exactly the same here at home, then the war hasn't stopped, you know, because capitalism is war, you know, because poverty is a crime. Poverty is, is genocide to our people. So that's why the concept of war is a really interesting one. And um, what we're seeing right now, of course, whether it's the attacks uh, by the police on Africans all over this country, whether it's, um, you know, immigration raids and putting our people, our children in cages, that's war. Whether you're talking about now, you know, people not being able to be tested for this COVID-19, you know, that's a form of war. Uh, you know, the fact that so many people are going to lose their homes again, like they did uh, 10 years ago, that's another form of war. So the concept of war is relative. And we know that our people have been living as hell ever since we were int introduced to, to the Europeans, you know. So um, it, it's real interesting that, you know, I think that I, I can say we're peaceful people. But at the same time, man, like our whole existence for the last five centuries has been nonstop and absolute war. Um, most of the time, we haven't had uh, the capacity to defend ourselves, but I think our generation has now the historic responsibility of being able to organize our communities and defend our people from this onslaught of war, not just the physical war, which is obvious like tanks and helicopters and things like that, but I'm talking about everything that we see on a daily basis in our communities. That's the war that we have to prepare our communities for, and it's not like a you know, we're not just making this up. And when we talk about war, it's real. You know, the, the, the thousands of people who died at the border who continue to die at the border. Now that it's getting hot again in the summertime, we're going to see uh, an escalation of the deaths at the border. The people who are the children who are dying at these detention centers, even before the COVID-19 crisis, all of this stuff, man, we're constantly under attack and uh, we have to we have to defend ourselves. So in the recent years, there's been a, a, a gaining of popularity of a phrase, settler colonialism. Now, this is a, a phrase that, you know, it's been around forever, but like, but it's, it's really in the last couple of years, uh, kind of on the tips of people's tongues, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, you have such a clear, uh, precise way of explaining things. Can you explain to our audience who are, are familiar with that phrase, but not exactly sure, what does that mean in day-to-day -day reality? What is settler colonialism? That's a great question, man. And I think so for so many years, I felt like, you know, I'm a member of Unión del Barrio, and that's a terminology that we've been using for literally decades. And it's, it's great to know that that's really now kind of almost, you can say, mainstream, at least as far as the left goes. Um, 
But settler colonialism is, uh, acknowledges the fact that as indigenous people, we are we have been here for thousands of years, um, and it says that the current nation state and those in power, you know, the American government is a settler colonial institution. It's a, it's a settler colonial um, government that I want to say second class citizens, but really like like the foreigners or illegals or whatnot, right? And what we have to see is that for us, this on this territory here, it's kind of like the Gaza Strip, you know, just what like Israel is doing to our Palestinian brothers and sisters right now is exactly what we've been experiencing since 1846. That's why we are in solidarity with the Palestinian people, because we know what the illegal settler occupation means. It means that you have a foreign entity, a foreign group of people. In our case, it was Spain, and now it's the United States. Uh, we have friends in there for a while, too. They came into our territory. They, they built their nation state, meaning their government, their institutions on our territory, and then systematically used them to keep us at the bottom of the social political strata. And that hasn't changed since. And, you know, it's as we, you know, to put into the context of the current uh, pandemic, we see, for example, right now, like in Arizona, New Mexico, how the Navajo Nation is being uh, devastated by, by this illness. Um, it, it just, it, it once again reminds us that the Europeans were the ones who brought these things here and now we're the ones that, that are paying the consequences. So that's why when we say that we want uh, freedom and liberation, we mean that in a physical sense. We're not talking about some like um, some idea or some abstract notion or some cute thought of like being free, meaning I can wear whatever shirt I want, I can say whatever I want on, on, you know, on Facebook Live. No, we mean physical freedom, meaning land. Meaning we want the land that was stolen by the Europeans. It needs to go back to the people who have been here first. And now today, when we talk about liberation, we know that that's not gonna come, uh, that's not gonna come easy. We know that imperialism, colonialism, um, it's like our, our comrades from the African People Socialist Party, uh, they describe it as, um, what's the term that they use? Um, they basically say it's a, it's a parasitic relationship, right? They're a parasite. Colonialism is a parasite. It's like a, a worm in your gut, meaning it, it's an outside entity that comes inside of you and you do all the work, meaning you're the one eating and working and doing all the hard work but the parasite is the one sucking all the nutrients out and they're getting bigger and bigger as the as a result of your hard work and we're getting skinnier and skinnier and skinnier and the one who isn't doing any work they're the ones becoming bigger so it's a parasitic relationship so when we decide that we want liberation that means that if we want to free ourselves it's going to change the colonial relationship as of now, we're colonial subjects. That's why even though we're indigenous people, they call us illegal aliens on our own territory, right? If we were to change that, to reverse that, that means that the people who have enjoyed the, the wealth, the riches, the resources of these lands for now, you know, uh, more than 150, 160 years, their lifestyle will change. Their living conditions will change. You know, white America cannot live this high standard of life if the rest of the world takes back the resources. That's why they are hell bent on attacking Venezuela. They're hell bent on continuing to attack the Middle East and in other places because it's all about resources. So when we talk about the settler colonialism, the settlers are the Europeans. Today they may call themselves white or Americans, but they're the settlers. And only because they were born here doesn't mean they're not settlers, right? So this is a struggle we're in today is to organize our community, because even our own community had, doesn't have an understanding of this stuff. You know, the masses of our people don't understand this stuff yet. But I think that the masses of our people still have a little bit of that, um, whether it's nationalism or whether it's a little bit of that, you know, being proud of our culture and knowing that the gringo took our land kind of thing, right? They know that, our people know that. Um, our job is to educate them and to organize them so that we can improve the living conditions of our people, man. Because right now, even before this whole COVID-19 thing, We've been under attack and our people, even though we're like the hardest working people in this country, we're some of the poorest people in this country. So something that, something has to change. Yes. Uh, you mentioned Venezuela in, in this and you've been a long, a long time supporter, a very long time vocal, um, very, you know, very seen uh, supporter of the, the Bolivarian uh, revolution for, you know, again, a lot of people watching this comes from a wide cross section society. 
Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the Bolivarian Revolution and, and what that represents? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was lucky enough to go down to Venezuela twice in 2005. And um, I was able to see with my own eyes what the revolution looked like at a young stage. Uh, you know, Chavez came into power in 99. I was there in 2005. So everything was still pretty fresh, pretty new. And I was able to see with my own eyes what a society that was going through a transformation looked like. And it was amazing. It was amazing to see, you know, Afro-Venezolanos, indigenous Venezolanos, people who have for centuries been completely ignored, now all of a sudden take a leading role in the struggle for the, the change of their country. And, you know, the Bolivarian Revolution uh, showed me as a teacher, I was a brand new teacher at the time, uh, I went into classrooms that had literally 80 year old women learning how to read next to a 10 year old little kid in the same classroom. Uh, those are the social missions that they called them uh, where they educated the masses on how to read, how to write, et cetera. So you had a situation with the Bolivarian revolution where the masses of the people, the working class people in Venezuela who had never enjoyed uh, the resources, you know, the oil of that country, all of a sudden, when, when uh, Chavez, uh, Hugo Chavez, uh, started a socialist government in Venezuela, they started using those resources that had previously only been uh, enjoyed by the oligarchy, the small group of people who had all the power and the wealth. Now that power and wealth was being redistributed to the masses of the people. And for the first time, working class people had access to those resources and they were living better. They were getting health care. They were getting education. They were getting housing. I know just recently, I think they just uh, built a the, the three millionth uh, house in Venezuela that they've given away to working class people. So you had in Venezuela, um, you know, after Cuba, another shining example of what socialism could do in, uh, for, our, for our people. And, you know, because it was uh, being very successful, because it was bringing millions of people out of extreme poverty and millions of people into participating in the democratic process and, and supporting their government, that was something that the United States absolutely could not handle. So therefore they started the attacks on Venezuela and we saw how they tried the first coup on Chavez. And until this very minute, they're still trying against Maduro. And now of course the United States is in a completely ridiculous position where they have to try to do anything and everything to try to get into Venezuela. Now they're saying that uh, President Maduro is, is, a, is a, 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 narco, a narco. I mean, is this really ridiculous? But um, what, we, what I saw when I was there and what I know now is that Venezuela, like Cuba, is a country of proud people. It's a country of people who are not going to just allow U.S. imperialism to go into their country um, and, and, and to take it over like they did in Iraq, for example. I know the people in Venezuela will fight tooth and nail to defend the revolution, to defend the revolutionary process, to defend democracy. And... Um, there's a reason why the U.S. hasn't gone into Venezuela. It, it wouldn't be as easy for them. So there's a reason why they haven't done it. And I think for us, um, our job here being that we live inside the belly of the beast is to educate our community about Venezuela and to say that, you know what, in Venezuela, for example, comparing it to Mexico, in Venezuela, when I was there, uh, it blew my mind. The guy who picked us up from the airport, he had to go to the gas station to pump gas because he was out of gas. And I didn't, I didn't know, you know, the the exchange rate or whatnot. So when he pumped gas, I asked him, hey man, how much And he did the calculations in his head. He goes, about a dollar and 60 cents to fill up his, his truck, his gas tank. And I was like, what? I was blown away. Because of course here you pay more than that for one gallon. Yeah. Now Mexico, Mexico, another oil producing nation mm -hmm. has their gasoline is more expensive than it is in the United States. So I said, well, how can that be? If both oil producing nations, uh, you know, should be able to offer their, their gas cheap to their people, how come Mexico is so different? And of course, we know that's Mexico, their government. Uh, it's a neoliberal government, and we see those differences. So Venezuela is something that we have to support. They have the, the support of the world. Yes, there's some countries like Spain and others that support uh, this, this clown Guaido. But we know that the, you know, the majority of the world understands that the president is Nicolás Maduro, and uh, that they're going to support Venezuela. Yeah. Uh, again, so this is being viewed by or, or potentially viewed by a wide cross section mm -hmm. of the population. So could you tell us a little bit into the a little, give us a little insight into the tragic comedy of one Juan Guayu? Yeah. So when the U.S. Had, cannot defeat Venezuela uh, at the ballot box, 
I think the revolution has won something like 19 elections, both presidential and like congressional and that kind of stuff. And I think the one time that they lost an election uh, was when uh, I think Chavez was trying to get more constitutional power and the people voted no and Chavez accepted the defeat and said, okay, we won't do it. But so Guaido comes after Nicolas Maduro easily wins re-election. Uh, the US tries to say that they invalidated it. Uh, however, we should recall that President, US President Jimmy Carter, he himself was an observer in Venezuelan elections. And he said that Venezuela had the best elections in the world. He has himself said that, okay? But he's not the president anymore. The current administration, um, like the previous, like Obama, Obama was just as anti, uh, you know, the Bolivarian Revolution as Trump is now. Um, they, they can't win. They cannot defeat the left uh, through elections. Therefore, they have to resort to violence. So the U.S. has been trying to uh, sabotage the Venezuelan economy through attacking their oil fields, through attacking their any type of economic activity that they have. And when all of that wasn't working, uh, they had to find a puppet. Imperialism will always find a puppet. We've seen this across the world throughout history. And the puppet was Guaido. And Guaido, uh, who was, by the way, democratically elected um, into their, you know, their governmental system, um, they said that Venezuela doesn't have a democracy, that it's a total dictatorship. Well, that's interesting. How did he become a member of the government? <laughs> he was democratically yeah. elected, right? So if they didn't have a democratic process, then he couldn't even be in that position. Anyway, so he was, he was, he, he called himself the new uh, president of Venezuela. So um, it was basically usurping the power of President Maduro, who was the constitutional and legitimate president of that country. So, of course, the United States was the first country to recognize Guaido as a new official president of Venezuela. And then you had Spain and other, the, the, you know, the classic, uh, the same, um, the same, the same clowns as always. But the people of Venezuela stood up. And of course, Univision and Telemundo and CNN showed the marches of the people who supported Guaido, but they, you know, conveniently left out the footage of the masses of the people who came out all over Venezuela wearing red in support of the Bolivarian Revolution. So Guaido is really an afterthought. Now he's just, uh, you know, a joke in history. No one takes them seriously anymore. And whether they love it or not, President Maduro and the Bolivarian Revolution is still in power. And as of this week, I was seeing the numbers, a, a poll taken in Venezuela, that over 70% of the Venezuelan people um, support uh, or approve of the way that the government is handling this COVID-19 crisis. So over 70% mean that even the right wing are seeing that the revolution is serving the interests of the people. And that's important to see because if you look at Venezuela, you look at Nicaragua, you look at Cuba, you look at Vietnam or any of these uh, countries that are on the left, um, with all, you know, they, with their defects and everything, their imperfections, they, they're taking care of the people and the, the health of the people comes before the profits like we see here in the United States. So I think that's an important thing to, know, to, to mention as well. I, I, want, I want to get back to um, your own personal history in the defense of the Bolivarian uh, Revolution back, uh, back in the days of uh, Mr. Danger, um, yeah. as, as Hugo Chavez called him. But, uh, but, but, but quickly, you mentioned now that, you know, like uh, the, the, in these governments where priorities are very different, um, there's, they're able to respond to, to crisis very differently. So why is it, I've been posing this question to, to many of my guests, why is it that a market system is incapable of producing uh, the necessary items uh, that the, to, to help us get through a, a, a pandemic? Right, because in, in a capitalist system, it's all about supply and demand, right? And if you're trying to provide healthcare for the entire nation, that means you would have to produce a lot more, you know, ventilators and the PPE and all that kind of stuff. But capitalism has no interest in protecting the lives or the health of people like you and I. So they know that when a pandemic or a massive earthquake or Hurricane Katrina or something terrible of, to that scale happens, they're not worrying about us. They only have to produce enough so that the people with, with the money so that they can survive. That's the reality of things, you know. There's no profit in saving poor people's lives, right? And then for a capitalist system, that's what they care about. Whereas when we look at places like Cuba, for example, who have a fraction of the resources that the United States government has, you know, when they have a national emergency like hurricanes that they deal with pretty much on a yearly basis, it's rare when you see that many, uh, more than even 10 people dying in a hurricane in Cuba. 
because the whole country, all of the resources of the country are put at the disposal of, of whatever it takes so that they save the lives of their people. And that's the difference between a socialist uh, government and a capitalist one or a neoliberal one, like most, like a lot of the countries in Latin America, is that most of these puppets in Latin America, you know, they only kiss ass to uh, to the U.S. Even Trump, I think today, he tweeted about how the president of El Salvador uh, has has worked really well with him at the southern border, and that's why they're giving El Salvador ventilators. Uh, you know, how many ventilators are they sending to Venezuela, for example? Right, none, because you have to basically kiss the boots of the empire in order to uh, get treated with any kind of, um, I don't know, to get anything from them, I guess. Yeah. So uh, with Venezuela, it's important that we see that um, they've been able to do what they can under the different embargoes that the U.S. has on them, uh, the different military threats they have on them. And of course, they're also being sabotaged by their neighbors in Colombia who are completely bankrolled by the United States and they've been for generations now. Um, so. That's why it's important, man. It's important that we see what's happening in Venezuela. It's important that for, for a continental movement that Venezuela uh, stays alive because if they don't, what happens is what we saw in Bolivia, where in Bolivia, unfortunately, the, the, the movement there didn't have the military strength to protect their leader, Evo Morales. So you saw a coup that led to now um, a government that now doesn't serve the interests of the people, but it serves once again the interests of the rich. So we cannot allow that to happen in Venezuela. So we see we see in Cuba um, that there are more doctors per capita than, than anywhere in the world, and they're able to send doctors around the world. And mm -hmm. yet we hear in the United States, and not just from not just from the dominant culture or white people or the gringos or whoever, but from our own community, we hear things like, "Well, if they don't pay the doctors well, no one's going to want to be a doctor." Uh, if they don't do this, then they don't do that. Uh, Cuba, you know, yeah, but it's a dictatorship. And yeah, da, da, da. I mean, I had people telling me that the Cuban government was very tricky. And just because I didn't see homeless people in Havana doesn't mean that they weren't there and they were hiding them somewhere. I mean, which is really, I mean, like, I, I like to think that I'm doing pretty good as a writer, but I don't think that the Cuban government was like, Matt Cedillo is coming, hide the homeless. We don't, <laughs> so I'm just like that. And I don't, I, and I don't think that they're like uh, the supervillains from like Spider-Man where they can make create a grand illusion. I, I just can't see it. Um, so what I'm saying is that, 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 that there's, a, there's a certain level of reaction, anti-communism, anti, you know, whatever, within our own community that we have to deal with. What, yeah. what can we do to better communicate these things if people are already at the point where they don't like being oppressed, they don't like being, being humiliated, they don't like making less money than their, than their counterparts of different, you know, with different backgrounds. But they don't. They don't think that the solution is somehow having a revolutionary politics. Well, how do we get people past from one point A to point B? Right. I'm not. Sure, I don't know if it was Stephen Biko in South Africa that said that there are none more hopelessly enslaved than those who believe to be free. Right. And I think that's the case a lot of times with our people is that you know only because we eat three times a day or at least two times a day that we think oh you know that we're doing all right you know but. You know, we've been colonized and going back to settler colonialism, we've been colonized for now uh, more than 500 years. So, you know, part of colonialism is to purposely miseducate the colonial subjects so that they don't rebel against the empire. And that's, you know, that's the, the condition that our, the majority of our people are in today. Being that we don't know that history, we don't know that politics, we're afraid, we're afraid to fight for our freedom and liberation because we believe it's just not possible. Um, we believe that it's just, you know, that's just the way it is. You know, my mom told me before, she says, oh, mijo, pues siempre fue así. It's always been that way. Because we don't have a historical uh, understanding that actually, no, we used to be free people and we used to live well. Uh, and we used to enjoy our own resources on our own land, you know. So I think when people come into that understanding, um, that's the only way that we can get them to turn over and to join revolutionary politics. And I think that, you know, history tells us that, uh, it's, a, it's a generational thing. And, you know, there was a 60s and 70s. And I think it's, it's coming back around again. And I think, um, you know, I think even sometimes like even the most Hispanic, and of course, I mean that in the most derogatory term and way, anybody who calls himself a Hispanic has no self-respect or doesn't know the history of that term. Even the Hispanics loathe Trump. Even they know there's something wrong with him. So I think this is a, a chance and an opportunity for us as people who are involved politically to continue to educate our people 
and to continue to organize so that we can improve the living conditions of our people and eventually, because we're nowhere near that, but eventually become free people once again. And we have every responsibility to do that um, because it's only sensical. That's not a radical thought, you know? If somebody steals your car, you're gonna wanna get your car back. If somebody steals your bike or your, your jacket, you're gonna want it back. And as people who have your entire continent stolen from them, it's only righteous that we want it back. And I think that, you know, that's something that our people are, are, are gonna come around to uh, eventually. And it's our job to steer the ship in that direction. So we have, um, we have some questions in the comment section, but I, I have two more questions for you wine cover first and then, then we'll get to those. Um, so, you know, you, you've been talking a lot about Venezuela, you've been talking about um, uh, Chicanos, talking about the Mexican-American war, talking about, um, you know, the, the, the dirty wars and the, and, the, and the proxy wars, guerrilla wars in, in, in Central America, and all mm -hmm. these things, the machinations that the U.S. has had against, uh, you know, our people from all over the continent. Um, I, I noticed in recent times, um, certain news outlets where people kind of get their politics, um, you know, they, they get their politics because on, 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 I don't know, I call it almost, I don't know what exactly you call it. It's like kind of like a, uh, the Trojan Gusano or something. They, 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 <laughs> it, the, the, the site I'm referring to mostly is Romescla, where we see that there are a lot of good things, a lot of interesting things about culture. Like, oh, look at that. Um, but then we see that they have backed Guaido. They have backed um, Inez. They have uh, slandered uh, Hugo Chavez. They have slandered Evo Morales. They have slandered Rafael Correa. Uh, they celebrated the death of Vito Castro. Um, and, but in addition to all these things, in addition to all these, these horrible right-wing Miami politics, uh, President Romescla, they were also part of a really big push uh, during the, the Mecha name change to highlight individuals who were calling for that. So it seems to me that they are opposed to national liberation, whether it be in Venezuela, whether it be in Cuba, whether it be in Bolivia, or whether it be in the United States Southwest um, and with the, the, the plight of the Chicano people. Um, do you agree with this? I'm, I'm, I'm editorializing at this point, but uh, it's, I really hate them really, I, very passionately. So can you, can you, do you agree? Yeah, I mean, look, in any, in any movement, in any society, you're gonna have, you're gonna have the left, you're gonna have the right, and you're gonna have the liberals. Mm -hmm. And the liberals are the ones that will sell out their mothers uh, to be staying good with the right. And whether they want to admit it or not, I mean, these are loyal servants of the empire, okay? Mm -hmm. If you, serve, if you side with the empire against revolutionary forces anywhere in the world, then you're serving the interest of white power and of the system of the empire. Um, now, if they have disagreements with governments on the left, that's fine. If they have disagreements with the movement, that's fine. You can articulate that, that's fine. But you don't go against them, okay? You don't side with the oppressor at any, at any juncture. You don't do that. And I think that uh, these liberals who... Um, you know, it's, it's easy for them to thump their chest and, and say that they're anti-Trump, but then turn, they'll turn around and go mislead our community into voting for another uh, imperialist or capitalist or racist or, or uh, you know, predator like freaking Joe Biden, right? It, they won't miss a beat. They will always tell our communities to support our, our other oppressor, um, which is, of course, the Democratic Party. So, you know, it's, you know, the uh, Lenin had the Mensheviks, uh, you know, it's just part of, it's part of history, man. There's always going to be those people who are going to run and say, no, we can't win no revolution. No, revolution is not possible. Well, that's, that's what we got to tell them. You know what, man, stay out of the way and either put in the work or shut the fuck up, get out the way. Because people who are serious about revolution and about yeah. the struggle are going to yeah. do whatever we can, whatever we can, you know? For every time there was a Malcolm X, they came up with a Jesse Jackson, okay? And there's a whole lot of Jesse Jackson types in our community that are, you know, they're quick to badmouth people like you and I. They're quick to badmouth uh, uh, Fidel Castro and Hugo Chavez. But they don't say anything about the, the other people who really are oppressing us. Like, you know, were they just as anti-Barack um, Obama? Or are they going to be just as anti-Joe Biden? No. Right, it's 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 easier for them to attack us than it is to attack the real enemy of our people, which is the system, the Republicans and the Democrats. So, um, you know, a lot of the times, I don't even want to debate with people like that because at the end of the day, 
what they say in a, in a way is kind of irrelevant. Like they don't lead any real movement. They're not part of any organization. Um, they're not part of a, of a social movement. They may, they may be part of like a, a Twitter movement, but that's, that's all fine and great and all, but that's not going to liberate land. That's not going to close a detention center. That's not going to stop capitalism, you know? So they can tweet all they want. I don't, I don't really yeah. care. We're too busy doing real stuff in, that, in, in communities, uh, trying to defend our people from real physical harm, not some, um, you know, retweet or post on, on Facebook or whatnot. I mean, you know, we all, we all do that. You know, we all post stuff, but we have real work to do. See, I, I, when I see them as being, being a real, real dis, disruptive force, and that's kind of a big part of, of why, um, of why me and a few others, we formed Telahaguar, which was really, we kind of viewed ourselves as not so much in the role of Unida Barrio or, or La Raza Unida or, or parts that, we kind of almost feel like security, almost like the, the, the shut the fuck up brigade, you know what I mean? Like that was like <laughs> to clear the road like that. <laughs> so that other people could actually do the organizing. Like, you know, like you want to you 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 talk shit, you want to fight around, you know, I, I got time. I especially got time right now. Um, so that's kind of like part of like what we're thinking, but like you had, you, uh, you know, it's been a while, but but back in the day, you had some run-ins uh, with uh, with one uh, cable news outlet, Fox News, which you were constantly um, being harangued by, and they were trying to trying to get you fired. They're trying they're trying to get you in trouble all the time. Um, what I mean, like most of us aren't going to get interviewed by Fox News. Most people aren't going to be here, but they are going to be under the attack of the right wing. Having experienced that level of right wing attack, what are some of the lessons you've drawn and the advice you can give when 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 we out there fighting for something, uh, why, fighting for you know a better day, end up getting attacked by the right wing. What are some of the tactics we should employ in order to not get drawn into their to their to their their game and, and get our work done? Yeah, um, you remember that movie Walkout, that scene where the uh, the dad is talking to his daughter and he says, you know, when you step into the ring, you're gonna get hit, right? And and that always rang true to me, and I think that you know, this, this work that we do, the movement that we participate in. And for me as a socialist, as a revolutionary, the political line that we agree to and, and that we are advancing, um, we know that that's gonna come uh, with, with some costs. And, you know, um, at the very beginning of this, I mentioned as a Salvadoreño, you know, I have family, I have family members who died in combat in El Salvador fighting for freedom. And I think that those of us here who can struggle uh, in whatever way that we can, we have the our duty is to do that to struggle and you know if you're serious about struggle you know that that can mean serious sacrifice um sacrificing everything uh whether that's you know like uh whether that mean like um being killed or losing your job or, or facing whatever kind of threat that the enemies are going to throw at you um if you if you really are legit if you're serious about your convictions to struggle then you're going to face those threats and you're going to move forward anyway. And I don't mean that like in an irresponsible way or like a, in trying to be a martyr. Like, no, I, I don't want that. And I don't want that for any of my comrades. But I think that we can't allow our enemies to put fear in us to the point where we can no longer operate and struggle for our people. So when, when Fox News was at, after me hard uh, years ago or, or other stations, um, you know, it's it's something that I had to basically say, look, man, I, I knew what I was getting into. I knew I know the right wing is powerful. They have a, a huge media outlet that's going to serve their interests, but we have to move forward. And I think that the lesson learned for me is that if you're going to get involved in political activity and you're going to speak truth to power, you better be part of a serious organization who's going to back you up no matter what. Because if I was on my own, um, that would have been real rough, man. But as yeah. part of an organization, I knew I had people who would back me up. And that's what allowed me to, to push forward. And you know, like when I went in, when I got interviewed again with Fox News, they try to they try to scare me. They try to make me say that I wasn't a socialist. They try to say that you know that I did you really mean what you said? And I was like, yeah, I'm a socialist. I believe in revolution, and this is what we're gonna do. And I think that that's that's the attitude that we have to have. Now, you know, we have to be intelligent about it. Do I say that while I'm working on the clock? No, that's my job. You know, that's something different. Yeah, right. But the work that we do when we're not getting paid, when we're off the clock, that's when we have to speak truth to our people and speak truth to power. And I think to do that. And I won't do that until the day that I die. Yeah. 
So uh, I'm gonna we have we we have a few questions here. I think we have time for uh, maybe huh. maybe two of them. Um, so let, let, let's look at this question here. Uh, uh, this comes from uh, uh, Karina uh, Akri uh, Faiz. I'm, I'm gonna get that. I'm gonna get her name. I really should have her name right already, but I'm gonna get that right eventually. Um, another member of Telahawar. She says, uh, "Hi Ron, what is your opinion of Rasa who say that, that the progressive Democrats, uh, who say they are progressive Democrats and feel it is strategic to run as Democrats?" Because they claim to have to, uh, to be a Democrat in order to have a chance at winning. Yeah, um, I appreciate the sentiment, um, you know, and I think that there's a lot of really well-intentioned people. I think some of the most dedicated, moving people I've ever seen are some of the Bernie Sanders. They travel the country. They put in their own resources. They really believe in that cause, and I think that's noble to do that because they're they're disciplined and they're dedicated to what they believe. I, I don't agree with their politics uh, because of the fact that uh, having, I think, a little bit better of understanding systematically of what the Democratic Party represents in history and at the current stage in time, you know, Malcolm X taught us that lesson more than 50 years ago. You know, Corky Gonzalez taught us that lesson more than 50 years ago. And they told us that the answer is not the Democratic Party. And if people think that by being part of the Democrats is the only way that you can win, what I would tell them is that that means that you believe in their system and that that's the only way to play the game. I'm yeah. saying that's not our that's not our game to play, and that system was never intended for people like us to even participate in. Now they allow us to participate in in this game, but knowing damn well that whether Party A or Party B wins, it doesn't matter because the rich stay in power and the people at the bottom are going to stay at the bottom. And that's not yeah. something that we should be interested in. And I think that I sincerely hope that all of those people who were supporting the Bernie Sanders campaign, I, I do believe that they're well-intentioned and they have good hearts. You know, now that I hope they see the true nature of the Democratic Party and the so-called democratic system here in the United States, they'll know that it's a farce, it's a sham, it's completely undemocratic. It has to do with who can buy elections, who can fundraise you know, the most for these elections. I hope those people join the real left or, you know, I don't sound to mean to sound mean, but Join the real revolution. Uh, Bernie Sanders talked about revolution, but that wasn't a revolution. That was a, a progressive, you know, um, push to uh, reform the Democratic Party. But you can't reform something that's completely corrupt, completely just putrid and, and disgusting. And there's there's nothing worth saving in that party. And when people say, "Oh, you know, we got to take America back. We got to take the Democratic Party back," I would love to know when that was ours. I would love to know when that served our interests. So for all of those folks who say that we have to join the Democrats, I respectfully disagree. I think history clearly tells us otherwise. And I think that we will, as a people and as a working class would be much better off if all of those people brought their skills, their resources, their dedication, their energy into uh, building a social movement and eventually a revolutionary movement that can really bring about fundamental change uh, in this country. Uh, yeah, it's a two-part question. The next part says, uh, they are, I think you may have answered this already. I mean, if you feel satisfied with what you said. Uh, they are out there recruiting Rasa to vote for uh, Democrats for them, and they claim they will bring material changes that people want to see in their lives. Isn't this an example of siding with the oppressor? Absolutely. <laughs> my, one of my favorite political quotes ever is when Malcolm X talks about the political chump, right? He says, anytime a political party comes in here, you know, at election times or whatnot, and uh, you put them first and they put you last, that means you're a chump. And not only are you a political chump, but you're a race traitor. And I think that is the most perfect um, answer to that question because the, De the Democratic Party is our oppressor. And I don't mean that in some kind of like, that's not even an opinion, man. Like if we see what the Democrats have done to our people through time, through history, that is absolutely what they are. They are the enemy of our people. Yep. Um, maybe they are a little nicer to us than the Republicans, but at the end of the day, they're still an enemy. And we should not support our enemy in any way, whether that's material, like funds, or whether it's our votes. I think that's what we have a lot to learn from like the Raza Unida party in that example, where uh, that was a valiant effort. And I think we should learn from that as we move forward, seeing that electoral politics is just one way of struggle. There's other ways to struggle. And that's why as Unión del Barrio, for example, um, we do participate in electoral uh, uh, politics, but we're not trying to form an electoral party 
we're trying to form a revolutionary party, which means that electoral politics will be just one tool in our toolbox, but there's other tools to use in order to fight for freedom. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, definitely. It's, it's the party of Andrew Jackson and, and Polk. I mean, this right. is what I think. Um, I, I, I think, um, uh, you know, at Tel Aviv, we, we, we always, we always talk about smash the duopoly and that's, that's, that's our stance. We're very, right. we got to build outside these parties, either, I, both of them, you know, tied to wall street and to weapons manufacturers. I mean, it's, it's an absurdity. All right. Uh, we got another question, uh, coming from Paul Garcia. Is there a good way to reeducate some of those coconuts, gusanos, and the pistas to bring them into the revolutionary fold? I feel we often alienate potential allies by insulting their views rather than pointing out their ignorance. Good evidence can challenge and change minds. <laughs> it's got, uh, answer the question, but it's kind of funny that he says, like, these mafistas, gusanos, blah, blah, blah. You know, <laughs> well, we can't insult people. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I think that, like I mentioned a little bit earlier, even like the most Hispanics of the Hispanics, except for maybe the Miami Cubans or something, um, most of our people see Trump as, as an enemy to our interests, an enemy to our people. So I think that we have the opportunity um, to educate our folks. I think a lot of people right now are seeing that what some of us have been saying for many years was true. When we're talking about capitalism kills, we're literally seeing that right now with over 50,000 people dying of the coronavirus in the United States. When we talk about socialism, we'll provide healthcare for all. You know, I was, I was thinking about some of the uh, some of the people who just currently probably voted against Bernie Sanders right before this COVID-19 pandemic. And now they're probably thinking like, man, we probably should have voted for that guy because he would have given us health care. So I think that a lot of people who in the past maybe had some really strong disagreements with us, they may not agree completely with us today, but I think they're seeing that what we've been saying for many years wasn't crazy. And um, there's, there's, there's truth to what we're saying. So look, if people are, are open-minded and are willing to be educated on this stuff, we should educate them. But if they are like, you know, hardcore, there's different, there's a difference between being ignorant to something and being like an ideologically astute person who still chooses to side with the oppressor. That's different. Those people, not only would I not try to um, educate them, I think we should, we, we would need to be ready to engage with them in battle because that's, you know, history tells us, man, the puppets will always be willing to fight for their master. And we have to be ready for that as well. Okay, Ron, it's been, it's been an incredible hour. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to, to talk with me today. Um, is there anything people should know about uh, any projects you're involved with, anything that you want them to, to, to check out, anything you want to look into? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, right now, obviously, the, the biggest thing in the world is this pandemic. Uh, our people have to be safe, man. I think that, you know, right now, one of the most political things you can do is to be safe because uh, the system is trying to wipe us out. And we see in many parts of the country where you know African people and Rasa are the ones, indigenous people are the ones dying in the highest numbers. So we have to be really careful. We have to protect our families, protect ourselves, and at the same time, educate, organize ourselves. Uh, you know, I think that this time when some of us are lucky enough to be working from home, please take the time to read, to watch documentaries, to educate yourself about this stuff. Um, you know, the Bernie, the Bernie revolution's over. Um, now it's you know, one uh, sexist pig against the other. It's one capitalist imperialist against the other. Those aren't real choices. That's not democracy. Let's educate ourselves about other things. So I think that, you know, tuning into uh, programs like this or just reading is super important, man. So as in Wendell Valley, we were coming out with the video series about the pandemic, different videos from things of like how to protect ourselves, how to, you know, boost your immune system to uh, socialist healthcare and, and that kind of thing. Uh, those are things we want people to check out because another uh, another world is possible. You know, we can't we can't dance our way to freedom. We can't um, you know pray our way to freedom. We we have to organize. And we use the organization. And you'll see how difficult it is but then maybe you'll start to respect a lot of the work that we do because it's not easy and we don't get paid to do this. So um, we need to grow it so that one day we can truly be free people on our own land. So Matt, thank you brother for the, the invite, man. I, this is great. I really love doing this. Um, whenever, man, let me know, we can do it again. Yeah.
Sempre, companheiro. Thank you, brother. Thank you. All right.